This week on the tip of the week, we'll have another video discussion we recorded at the Public Health Preparedness Summit in Atlanta recently. I was a guest there of the National Association of City and County Health Officials, also called NACHO. Along with some of the other ProMed podcasters, we went down there and did some recording. We had Chris Montera there, Ann Robinson, a public health nurse from the EMS Garage, and Rick Rosati from the Mitigation Journal. And so uh, two of three of us were nurses and a paramedic. We went down there. We had some amazing conversations on those episodes and I'll actually have those linked as well over at promednetwork.com so you can catch all of the recorded segments we did but here's a segment we recorded just for the nursing show so check it out and enjoy hello and welcome to the nursing show I'm your guest host Rick Rizzotti and we're here at the NACHO sponsored podcast booth and we're coming to you live from the Public Health Preparedness Summit 2013 in Atlanta, Georgia. We are very proud to be here to help strengthen public health and healthcare response through innovation, integration and implementation. Our topic this afternoon is Medical Reserve Corps. I'm joined by very special guest, Mr. Captain Reed mm -hmm. and Deborah. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, Captain Reed, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, well, I'm a pediatrician by training. Um, my background uh, initially started off in the Navy. I was a Navy physician for 14 years, and during my tenure in the Navy, I actually had the opportunity to do a fair amount of humanitarian assistance, dis disaster medicine, and such. Um, and as a result, uh, I was brought into the U.S. Public Health Service about five years ago um, to continue that work. Um, and that's what eventually led me to my position with uh, the Division of Civilian Volunteer Medical Reserve Corps as their operations chief. Fantastic. And Deborah, how did you come to be in the Medical Reserve Corps? Actually, I started out my career with them as a volunteer in a local unit in Fairfax County, Virginia, and served with them for five years and was working as a government contractor at the time. Uh, the opportunity became available at NACHO for a project leader uh, working with their office, and it just seemed like the right fit for me at the right time, so took advantage of that opportunity. Fantastic. Now, Captain Reed, when you've got to go out and solicit for volunteers, or work with different community groups to get volunteers for the Medical Reserve Corps. What do you do? How do you go about that? Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily do that directly. Um, being uh, the Deputy Director for Operations in the Division of Civilian Volunteer Medical Reserve Corps at the national level, um, our program office is responsible for facilitating those efforts out there across the network. So we put together a variety of um, either grant systems or uh, best practices or um, frameworks within which the unit leaders at the local level then conduct that kind of outreach. Fantastic. Now, Deb, what are the, the, the qualities and people that you're looking for when you bring them into your, your unit? Well, I think the biggest thing about any volunteer is their heart. They're out there doing what they do because they really care about their communities, um, people who need assistance. and. Um, I think that's always going to be a, you know, a true factor of any volunteer you see out there. And then obviously people who have the background in some kind of disaster capacity or there's medical and non-medical positions. And I think that's one thing that's really interesting about the Medical Reserve Corps is it's not all medical positions. They're obviously key positions, but it also takes a lot of other people behind the scenes to make those uh, missions happen at the local levels. What type of activities do your volunteers typically participate in? You want to go ahead and sure. That? <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's ever changing. Um, it's ever expanding. Uh, the impetus behind the Medical Reserve Corps was uh, mainly born out of the aftermath of 9/11, when there was a recognition that the amount of service-minded folks who uh, came out to help um, didn't have a system with which they could be employed. So the Medical Reserve Corps took advantage of that situation and was devised to set up systematically a mechanism to take those volunteers in advance of disaster um, and uh, establish a way of bringing them into the system of emergency management, disaster response, uh, more formally. Um, so in that vein, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps started out very much in the field, the rather narrow focus of disaster medical response. However, in its 10-year history since, um, both naturally and somewhat by design, 
uh, the Medical Reserve Corps at the local level has adopted a sense of responsibility for fully the breadth of public health need. Um, and in that sense, um, they are now acting in a variety of ways from doing a very typical public health work in community outreach for health education, delivery of vaccination campaigns, um, those sorts of things, um, while at the same time still continuing that tradition that dates back to 2002 in providing medical assets in the time of disaster. Uh, now, Captain, let me stick with you for this next question. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to see the Medical Reserve Corps in five years or, or even ten years from now? Uh, where would I like to see it? Where um, would you like to see yeah, it? Yeah, well, I think just naturally what's taking place with the Medical Reserve Corps um, is where my aspirations would be for it as well. Um, most of what's happening in the evolution of activity and design of the Medical Reserve Corps is directly in response to the needs of the communities they serve, and as it should be. Um, you know, there's only so much at the federal level that we can do to recognize what those needs are at the local level and support, facilitate um, activities to, to respond to them. Um, whereas naturally, uh, those volunteers who function within local health departments or other systems at the local and community-based level, y y they have their finger on the pulse of those needs routinely. And therefore, they're adopting different methodologies to apply to meet those needs. And, and Personally, that's exactly what I'd like to see happen and continue to happen. And meeting the needs of the community at any time is what this is all about. Absolutely. Around the clock, within the full cycle of disaster and even beyond that. Mm -hmm. So should a uh, community do a needs assessment when putting together a uh, Medical Reserve Corps unit in their local area? Or how that, should they go about that? Yeah, that's actually part of um, a set of criteria that we have established as a um, uh, leading to the most highly functional units, um, that responding to a, a more formalized needs assessment is valuable. Um, we, we put that expectation out there for the network to respond to, although truthfully we need not. M most of the time it's done very innately. Um, the best example of that is given the fact that two-thirds of our units are housed within local health departments, they oftentimes fall right in line with the needs assessments that those local health departments have already conducted and respond to those needs. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, Deb, you've been doing this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Boots on the ground, hands getting dirty, doing this job. Could you share with our audience one of your most memorable experiences from being a member of the Medical Reserve Corps? Well, there's, it's hard to say that there's one, but I think the, the one thing you come with, away with every time is knowing, again, you've made a difference for you. It's, it's about your family, your friends, and your neighbors. And any time that you, whether it's a training exercise or it's an actual response activity from flooding, flu outbreaks, it doesn't matter. You know that what you're doing has that immediate impact to the people you care about most. It isn't, it isn't that it's not important for that greater scope on things, but when we look at you know, emergency uh, capabilities and disaster response is always about the local first. Um, it's gonna be a local disaster with local needs. And that's what's great about programs like this because it is local people doing the local needs for the people they care about most. So again, I can't say one incidence because there's been so many different ones, but every time you walk away knowing you've made a difference with the people that you care about and care about you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, let, let's bounce off that just for a minute. I have spoken to a number of folks from the Medical Reserve Corps, both at this summit and at, at other locations. I see them as ambassadors of preparedness for their neighborhood and their family. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself being asked questions by your neighbors and, and your family about how to get ready for certain events? And what do you tell them? All the time. It's, it's kind of funny because I live in an apartment complex and if I open up my back door, <coughs> excuse me, on my SUV, it is absolutely packed with emergency response things and the kids see that kind of stuff right away. And I end up having all kinds of impromptu sessions right at the back door of my SUV where we're talking about equipment. They get to play with some of the response equipment and first aid kits and and different you know, uh, ice packs and splints and types of things. So it's really, it's a great opportunity for those, that type of preparedness learning to go on. It's not all about, you know, like I said, the worst time you wanna learn something is when you're in a situation. It's about taking advantage of those everyday opportunities that somebody sits there and goes, you know what, I can sit a few things aside. I can put a first aid kit into my car. Um, these are things that are practical for me to do, and it makes sense for my family to do that too. So it's great, and great opportunities. I can't tell you how many times I've done that, and it's a lot of fun when that happens. I bet. Now, Captain Reed, your experience being at the, the top of the uh, chain of command, so to speak, what experiences have you, have you had filtered up from, from your, uh, your folks that indicate that this model is working? 
Oh, uh, I'm glad you put it that way. Uh, I came in on my position about a year and a half ago um, on the operations side. I work for Rob Tosada, who's the director of the MRC. Um, and uh, I've, I've been in a variety of different federal programs um, in uniform service, obviously. There's a bit of a bent towards that. But um, one of the things that struck me the most when I came into my position was how functional this system is and how unique it is in federal mm -hmm. service, too. Um, to have a system of response that's facilitated at the national level in many ways, but is completely operationalized at the local level, at the community level, um, was foreign to me. Um, you know, I was used to being the guy that was tapped to send out to go do something somewhere else on behalf of somebody else. That's not the way the system works. Um, the system works from the ground up. So literally everything we hear about what's going on out there works well. Um, there are some impediments to the system being as efficient as it could be, um, to being as regionalized or nationalized as it could be. Uh, but generally speaking, when it comes right down to it, the needs of the community are right there being witnessed by those that serve the community and responding to it naturally. Um, I, I think we could learn a lesson from that and extrapolate it to other programs at the federal level in many ways. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Deb. Last comments for our listeners. What do you want them to take away from, from this uh, talk on the Medical Reserve Corps? You know, we're getting ready to undertake some new campaigns, which the one is really uh, a phenomenal tagline is be the answer. And I think that if we go back to, again, what, what it is about neighbors taking care of neighbors, every person across this country can be the answer. So that's the thought I would leave this, you know, the, the group with today is just saying, you know, you can be that answer. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how what your age is or how skilled you are, there's some way you can contribute to the positive. Very nice. Captain Reed, last words for the public listening. Sure. Um, get to know your MRC. Uh, they're out there, they're everywhere. We cover 90% of the geographic area of the country and 95% of the population nearly. Um, uh, they are a ready resource. Um, you too can contribute to the MRC very easily, no matter whether or not you have uh, a medical or public health background. Um, nearly 40% of our volunteers yeah. actually are just that, non-credential providers, non-specialists, um, uh, and they, but they just bring their service-minded uh, uh, will and uh, contribute equally so. So everybody can be there. Get to know your MRC and participate. Get You'll find it very MRC. well rewarding. Yeah. Be the answer. Be the answer, yeah. Nicely done. Thank you both for joining us. This is The Nursing Show. I'm Rick Rosati, the guest host today. We're coming to you live from the Nature's sponsored podcast booth here at the Public Health Preparedness Summit 2013 in Atlanta, Georgia. We hope to see you again soon, especially if you can join us in July 2013 as Nature puts on their annual conference. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Until then, thanks for joining us. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>